Welcome to Bite Size Reviews, where we discuss short films of zombie movies you may or may not have seen and talk about what they did right, wrong, and everything in between the teeth. Link to the movie in question is in the description and pinned comment below. Today we are back for more with Left 4 Dead The Movie, an Italian non-profit fan-made film by Mexican Standoff Studios directed by Daniel Bellucci, dedicated to bringing the characters of Left 4 Dead 1 to life in a wholly unique storyline. Going forward, try to keep in mind that this was a passion project by fans that spanned the creative process of over eight years, starting in 2008, facing many financial, casting, and production hurdles, all with a non-profit motive until finally releasing in 2016. The film was also originally shot by Italian actors, and while the actors did their lines in English, it not being their native tongue, What? I don't steal a car. So, what did you What? I think all we stop here now. We can't stop. stop. But you know, stop it. Dubbed voice actors sent in their lines to sound more authentic to the original survivors. It was really a joy to watch for just about any Left 4 Dead fan. I'm all for praising it where it needs to be praised, but that also doesn't mean I won't be critical of how it was written or shot in some areas. Because boy, howdy, does it have some good parts and some hilariously bad parts. So, let's get right to it. The film starts off as a dream sequence for Zoe, scared and alone in a blood harvest looking forest, as she hears a hunter scurry around and roar, <coughs> using sound effects straight from the game, which is a nice touch. I'm glad they're using sound effects directly from the game. As we all know, the hunter's most notable trait is leaping long distances in powerful pounces. But for a fan budget movie, making an action like that look decent would be quite an endeavor and probably just a blurred mess. So instead, we get the sound of the hunter pouncing by as Zoe darts around to look for it until it suddenly appears and proceeds to just run at our heroine in a very kind of LARPing way to wake her up amidst her fellow survivors. Which the casting and likeness for Zoe and Lewis was decently done. While Bill has gained a few pounds and a lot more hair, and Francis, well, Francis looks nothing like his video game counterpart outside the leather vest donning an appearance more like an Italian greaser. Beggars can't be choosers, and again, it's a fan-made film, but I feel like they should have at least shaved the actor's head to make him more like Francis, or you know, how they portrayed him in promotional art. But we do have to keep in mind throughout this non-profit movie's production that staff and actors did have to be switched out due to budget issues, so the guy portrayed here is not the same as the Francis in the movie, but I still would have preferred if he shaved his head to look more authentic. You can make the argument that this is an alternate timeline months after the first infection where Bill survived, but still. Lewis hands a half chocolate bar to Zoe as we see some decent props of pipe bombs and pills scattered about, leading to the iconic safe room door and graffiti. I am liking the set design the movie has put out so far. It cuts to the foursome walking in the outskirts of a destroyed city at night, or at least I think it's night. It's obvious this was filmed at a brighter part of the day and a darker filter was placed over these scenes. Would have rather just had this shot at whatever time of day it was instead of making it hard to see what's going on with what you have shot. I know most of Left 4 Dead 1 is during nighttime, but this filter is not doing it for me. Now, the director did acknowledge this. He reached out to me and told me that the crew wasn't allowed to record at their shoot locations at night by the location owners themselves and admits that many people are going to have a hard time seeing what's going on. The objective of the survivors here is to go to Astoria, as Francis says, We are going to Astoria. It's a little fishing town. My brother, he lives up there. He has a boat. Although I find it strange that they are just now deciding what to do and recounting the plan out in the open, with all these Left 4 Dead zombies and infected just scattered about. And speak of the devil, here comes the horde. Or at least I think. It's kind of hard to tell with uh, how dark it is. They shoot at a small group before they just press on normally to find a well-lit school amidst the utter gray darkness that is the rest of the city. Interesting to see a place so well-lit amidst a zombie apocalypse. And more so the fact that you would want to go there in the first place? Considering it's basically a horde beacon, every infected in the city would flock to this area because of this light. We then get to the title card. 
Copyright Dead Meat Incorporated. So, this is the survivors months after the green flu outbreak in an alternate timeline since we get a flashback dating back a few months. The first of which, of course, is Zoe, whose canonical backstory was being a college student who spent most of her time watching horror movies, so they at least stuck to their source material, and I do appreciate them having Night of the Living Dead playing with Army of Darkness and Dawn of the Dead posters on the walls. Although I do find it cheeseball that we get a hooded dude, that turns out to be her boyfriend, sneaking in her window to feign the whole Hunter Zoe dynamic this movie likes to put up there for a little bit. She stuffs her stalker boyfriend in the cupboard as her father comes in to say he is leaving to take her mother to the hospital and is just going to leave Zoe at home by herself. I do appreciate at least a slight reference to Zoe's canonical backstory from the comics of her mom being infected, but I would much rather have had what the comics had provided where the stranger comes in, bites the mom, mom gets infected, mom bites dad, and having the gripping choice of Zoe having to mercifully kill her dad. I realize this would be a much more costly and difficult scene to shoot, but I'm not the biggest fan of her boyfriend putting on a second hoodie to obviously give him the image of the hunter. The film could have easily just had the scene of her boyfriend crawling in the window to give the not-so-subtle foreshadowing of Zoe having a predisposition against the hunter, but having a second slow creepy scene of him putting on a whole nother hoodie like he's from Assassin's Creed seems unnecessary. We already got the point. They end up doing the sex. As it zooms in on her boyfriend's arm, showing a visible bite mark. Despite the infection time of the green flu being extremely fast, the mom getting carefully taken to the hospital while bitten, and the boyfriend getting Zoe almost there, almost there. It's hard to believe this is the same green flu, but I will give it extra brownie points for being like a generic zombie movie. It is par for the course for cinematic experiences for the infection time to fluctuate for the story. Ending her flashback and putting us in Lewis's, where two of his co-workers berate him for being a liberal that went to the shooting range during his lunch breaks. Much less dramatic than the comics, where he literally caves in a guy's head in the bathroom, at least we get context as to why he is so good with a gun. That and a random stranger standing outside the building, smoking, coughs for a second. Don't you know these things will kill you? Bitch, I don't care who you are. I don't smoke, and I'm not a big fan of smoking, but you don't, you, you just don't take a lit cig out of someone else's hand and toss it. That's asking for a less than positive slap to the face or a punch to the gut. <laughs> While I can see that this is a precursor to the smoker, especially with how he is dressed, it just seems really out of character for the often optimistic Lewis to just shit talk to his co-workers. Just the only thing you shoot on a hunting trip is your friends in the lake. You might want to think about your life decisions. I don't care that you broke your elbow. And act superior to a random stranger for smoking that doesn't seem like something he would do. But hey, Gotta give each survivor their designated special infected in their backstories. Transition to a bar where Francis's forgotten brother Francois is finishing up a tall boy at the bar watching generic footage of cities on fire as the outbreak begins. He acts calloused as the bartender literally starts puking green goop and showing a whelp on his back after saying he was bitten by someone with maybe rabies. And then Francois just tosses him some change and walks out. I know Francis's thing is to hate everything and he's already a bit of a douche, but to this degree? I don't know, man. Francis, in the comics, spent his first night getting busy. Busy, as in almost screwing an infected chick, getting drunk and shooting 1,000 zombies from a bar rooftop with his gang. Again, I know that would be pretty difficult to pull the comic story off in a fan-made film, but Francois' cinema backstory made him into more of a loner jerk asshole who could give two shits about the well-being of others. Again, way more than the comics and games portray. So it's hard for me to think of this incarnation of Francis of somehow teaming up with other people. But at least we get his connection to the boomer here. I do really appreciate how we can see the backstories of the special infected as well and who they were before turning. And last but not least, Bill is at his home shaving and gets the I've been waiting for this day my whole life moment while his old timey radio broadcasts the pandemic. This time around, no special infected for old Bill. And just to compare to the comics once again, he was hospitalized and while falling asleep by anesthesia, is able to fight and kill numerous infected with nothing but his hospital gown and grit. 
a far cry for our more portly Bill just chilling at home. Overall, while the renditions of our classic four survivors aren't quite up to snuff with the originals in their comic backstories, it was still a decent effort to see what they can come of together. I am enjoying the live action versions of our survivors. Back in the present, the four survivors talk about their old schools in the dark and decide getting inside to use the still active radio tower is the best course of action. Now that does sound like something the survivors of the video games would do. Francis shoots the locked gate open, causing an alarm to go off to give us the ever famous, the horde is coming. The action is fairly decent as gunshots fly and infected hit the floor. A hunter creeping around, growling slyfully, nibbles at Francois' ankle ankles only to get absolutely blasted. To call back to her past, Zoe lines up the final shot on the hunter, acting reluctant to do so for a second and then just pops him. While neat to have that come full circle, this definitely wouldn't have been the first hunter she has gunned down at this point, so I don't know why she was hesitating. A new survivor appears above them, attempting to flee as the survivors chase after him. In a death toll church guy-esque fashion, the random survivor refuses to open the door for them, fearing they may be infected. As the horde is rapidly approaching them, the stranger wants proof that they aren't infected, and gives them a question only uninfected people would know. And it's nothing too hard, just the question of... Okay, okay. then tell me, who won the World Series in 71? Uh, okay, he even brings up that he was there as a kid? I don't understand why such a niche answer was needed for such a stressful situation. It's not even comical, just kinda random. And the fact that Zoe knew the answer out of all of them seemed out of place, as I don't remember her being too knowledgeable of baseball in the World Series. But hey, it's just something there so they can prove they're not infected. The stranger, now known as the school principal, Principal Gordon, lets them in and gives them a tour around, showing how well supplied and fortified the place is. But the Left 4 Dead fan in me keeps thinking how the hell have the infected not torn this place open by now. But I'm being a little too critical, I'm sorry. The principal goes over the shit he has been through and goes to his office while the foursome head to the infirmary to patch up Francois, who has a nasty bite mark on his shin. Bill then delivers a line that made me chuckle a bit. Hold still while I heal ya. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great reference to the game. Zoe has her moment in the restroom to reflect. Ah, uh, ah, uh, get what I did there. And then she has time to wash the blood off her hands. Ah, uh, don't judge me. Just bringing up pretty common cinematic visualizations. Lewis skims the infirmary and dives into the 2009 meme rabbit hole. Mm, pills here. Pills here. Pills here. P pills here. We cut back to Zoe rummaging through a classroom to find a squeaky gnome, a reference to Noam Chomsky, who recently was sent to space. Hope you're having fun up there, Mr. Chomsky. She also finds a kid's drawing to weep over. While sad, it just feels like it's there just to force a sad emotion. That's a shit drawing. The foursome are eating when the principal starts talking to them over the intercom. It's an intercom. Yes, Zoe the intercom. Louis and Francois voice their gratefulness as the principal asks where they are going after leaving the school. Francois brings up Astoria, and Gordon says it's 300 miles up north and the chances are slim. Francois's idea of where to go was half-assed, but at least there was a survivor around to convince them otherwise, hopefully. Especially since this one school apparently has a functioning radio tower to try and call for help. As they start to plan over the intercom, Francois puts a burrito in the microwave, which overloads the power grid, turning off the electricity, which funnily enough only happens after the survivors arrive. Perfect timing for this deus ex machina moment. Even more luckily, this school has a backup generator that powers the radio tower and they say it won't last long. Because we need to hurry up things and have some rising action. They rendezvous with the principal and begin heading to the church, while the principal walks away with a devilish smile. Hmm, I wonder if he has any bad intentions. A few common infected growl like hunters despite not repping the hoodie. The walls do have some graffiti that is another gesture of the Left 4 Dead franchise, which I do appreciate the dedication to the set design. 
I also noticed that each survivor is wielding the exact firearms that they had in the Left 4 Dead 1 opening cinematic, with Bill holding the M16, Francois the pump shotgun, Louis with the SMG, and Zoe holding the dual pistols. So a nice attention to detail that really makes you feel like a Left 4 Dead 1 survivor. The action that proceeds with taking out infected after infected is pretty decent. The camera angles, the tracking shots, really well done, and what I expect from a full movie experience of a horde attack. The director also informed me that 80% of the movie was shot in this real-life school, all during the summer holidays, of course. But that didn't stop a cleaning lady from walking in and seeing what was basically a bunch of dead and bloody bodies and blood on the floor in the hallways, causing her to break down and cry. That poor woman. But hey, it's, I mean, if it's making someone cry when they walk in, you're doing a good job. This is topped off with the atmosphere suddenly darkening and becoming quieter as they hear a witch weeping down the hall. It genuinely is a damn creepy shot as we see the darkened outline of the witch's frame, her eyes reddened, until she attacks, giving out a disturbing scream. <laughs> barreling down the hallway. We don't get to see much of her realistic design since she is cloaked in darkness, but the experience alone was actually pretty well done and actually made me feel like I was watching a horror movie for the first time in this flick. And it did give me the same vibes as when they encountered the witch in the Left 4 Dead 1 opening cinematic. With the Wicked Witch dead, the survivors progress to the church, which is right outside the radio station, where Lewis and Zoe, uncharacteristically, begin to argue religion as they stare at the cross-bound Jesus statue. Despite them having already been through a church in Death Toll, they decide, hey, let's have Lewis say God is dead, while Zoe says, no, he is real, and we are humanity's saviors. We are the chosen protectors of humanity angels on earth. While a character arc of Lewis dropping his cheerful demeanor and start giving up his beliefs and hope is probable in a zombie apocalypse, it can happen to anybody, it comes out of nowhere, especially with Zoe suddenly becoming super religious. And on top of that, assuming their immunity to the virus means they are the chosen ones. Again, uncharacteristic for a girl like Zoe to suddenly start talking like this. If I could sum up my feelings about this exchange, it would basically be like Bill and France wall in the background. As Zoe says an angel is looking over her, a decent looking CGI smoker wraps her up and pulls her away. While her getting pulled away is a bit sci-fi channel looking, the POV shot of Zoe being pulled away is handled well and shows how quick to act they are. Although I gotta ask, how did they not hear the smoker just chilling in the door, considering how much they cough in the games and how loud they are? Also, I'm surprised they didn't give Lewis the killing shot on the smoker since its pre-infection counterpart was in his backstory. You'd think the smoker would want to get revenge on Lewis for taking his cigarette. They find bloody drag marks leading into a room that the principal said to not go into before they had left. So of course, the three youngins vote to go inside with Grandpa Bill basically saying, oh, you darn millennials wanting to know the truth about horrible atrocities. Fine. They look inside and find the entire school staff bloodied and beaten to death, but not as zombies. They come to the conclusion that they were killed by a baseball bat. And who else wields a baseball bat all willy-nilly in a zombie apocalypse around here? That's right! It's Negan! Vampire bat! Oh, wait a minute. No, it's Principal Gordon. The survivors are maneuvering through the school once again and run into a very big and familiar friend. While I'm happy to see the boomer, something just seemed off about his face. Maybe it's n it's the nose being too dorky or something? But it's less than menacing waddle towards them without actually vomiting or posing a threat kinda just had me breathing out my nose at its presence and having wanted more out of it, wanting to see it puke on someone, you know, its trademark attack. Francois, however, does step up to the plate and kill his backstory special infected. With the preceding explosion splatting the cameraman, but not visually, 
or physically on the survivors. Which, you know, direct boomer bile making contact with non-infected survivors is what summons a horde. But I guess it wasn't in the budget to Nickelodeon slime the survivors or their outfits, so we'll have to make do with the cameraman getting boomed. Either way, a horde starts to swarm in as Zoe chucks a pipe bomb, which is another callback to the Left 4 Dead trailer that I do appreciate. And also, there is a comical outtake where the actor for Zoe, when throwing the pipe bomb, accidentally beans the hell out of a cameraman. I need help! <laughs> 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 Who did that come the horde explodes and they make their way into the radio station as Bill, a master of radio technology, easily finds an emergency channel with military comms. Because, well, it's Left 4 Dead, and all it usually takes gameplay-wise is just one press of the action button. So, kudos to the writers for sticking to the typical Left 4 Dead way of doing things, as the military comms say to hold out until they arrive via helicopter in the school courtyard. Unlike typical finales, though, two waves of hordes and tanks were not required for the rescue vehicle to arrive, as they just chill in the radio room for a little over four hours hours and wait. I guess the AI director was on an extended lunch break. The helicopter arrives as Gordon gets there ahead of our group of survivors, somehow knowing the Whirlybird would show up at this time of day, at this exact location, in this part of the country, localized entirely in the courtyard? Yes. I see. As the rushed and underdeveloped villain that is Gordon attempts to escape on his own, a deus ex tank begins screaming from afar. Luckily, the part of the roof the survivors are on is far away from the part that this static tank is on. Now, the tank doesn't look too bad. They, I think they did a good job for what it's worth, but I feel like he would have benefited more in a night or at least darker setting like the smoker and witch did before him. The tank kind of stiffly grunts and punches the ground for a second, pulling a rock from the roof beneath him. We get to see the tank from the side, and I feel like the model's head protrudes a little too outwardly, making it kind of funny looking, but besides that, it is still pretty cool to see the tank in live action. Action. Now what isn't spot on is how this rock hits the chopper. It just kind of tinks the helicopter and it starts spinning in a perfectly winded tailspin. A piece of concrete that huge would do more than just barely tink it to put it in a tailspin you would think. However physics might work, it surely doesn't work here as the helicopter spins disastrously in a small space making sure not to hit any buildings so that it perfectly crashes and lands on the conniving Gordon. Gordon, while this is all going down, just watches it slowly descend on him. And instead of running away, he just throws his hands up like going in defense mode will prevent him from taking battle damage. This whole exchange is what made me laugh the most. The helicopter spiral from a rock, Gordon just going, I know. And especially the tank on the roof in the side view as all this goes down. He just looks so proud of himself as he scurries around up there. Look at him. What a good boy. Did you do that? Did you make that miss? Oh, what a good tanky boy. The survivors revel in the karmic principles that crushed their dear principal, not really giving any mind to the military pilot that came to rescue them. They don't really care that the other guy died. The tank runs over to the destroyed helicopter, celebrating his victory over the metal big bird, and instantly catches a peek at the four survivors on the rooftop. Instead of instantly going for them like any other tank would, he just grunts some more so they can have this monologue about their living hell never coming to an end. Luckily for the survivors, instead of having to waste a Molotov and have this badass and flashy fight to take the tank down, Bill is able to spot a nuclear propane tank inside the helicopter and shoots it to blow up the tank and completely destroy it. How convenient that the helicopter was still able to explode this much. I was sad to see not more was done with Left 4 Dead's most daunting and brutal infected figure, but was happy to see him in a cheesy CGI form nonetheless. You know, I gotta give him some more brownie points for, you know, being similar to Left 4 Dead, because much like the gas station exploding in No Mercy, the explosion of the helicopter here seems to not draw the attention of any horde to the survivors. All so they can look up to the skies and see an airplane. You know, I shot my own zombie movies in college before, and I also thought an airplane passing by during shooting made for a great random shot, but here it does serve 
as hope for them. So I'm happy for our four survivors, I guess. The movie slowly starts to end after they just decide to find a car, hotwire it, and get away easily with no trouble. No alarms going off, no zombies attacking them. But not before giving us the iconic symbol of the franchise, the rotting four-fingered hand. Although I much rather would have preferred them doing some kind of actual practical effects with the hand instead of it being CGI, but I still appreciate the effort that went behind this and just the shout out to the fans. They drive off into the great sunset, heading to Astoria for that fishing boat of Francois' brother. Leaving the fates of Negative Lewis, I'm a God Zoe, Coach Size Bill, and Francie Pants Francois unknown. The credits start rolling. And while it gives a somber tone, I would have much rather preferred how every Left 4 Dead campaign ended with the iconic ending theme playing as it says the survivors have escaped. and then showing the actual names of the actors and who they played first. And instead of saying directed by Danielle Bellucci, could have gone with Danielle Bellucci as the director to really push that Left 4 Dead vibe and just bring up the whole fact of the director being an integral part of the games, considering how much they used Left 4 Dead sound bites and motifs so frequently up until this point. Despite some stark and nitpicking criticisms, I still love this film. I love the amount of effort and love and passion put into it for its cheesiness and its effects, to its Easter eggs and tributes to the fans, to its cornball acting and storytelling. While a majority of the scenes outside at night are somewhat of a pain to watch due to how unnecessarily dark they forced it to be, the action sequences we got were a delight and the character interactions weren't so bad. Although there were some parts of the backstories that could have definitely used some revisions in the writing process. It was a film with eight years of fan-created passion that built this all together with support by the Left 4 Dead community. And I highly recommend giving Mexican standoffs Left 4 Dead the movie at least one watch through as a fan of Left 4 Dead or even horror or zombies in general. And they have voiced that if they had a bigger and proper budget today, they would easily seek to remaster this movie, but are still happy with their final product as it is, and are still ecstatic to this day with the general response being Left 4 Dead fans simply enjoying a good flick. And they delivered. <laughs>